Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher video with myself, Jonathan LMS Pierce. This is a walk through the front line for the 17th of December 2022. Let's get right to it. What has happened overnight? Well, uh, some news. Well, let's give you the Ukrainian figures for the Russian losses. Remember, these are Ukrainian figures, so treat them with some kind of skepticism, pinch of salt. Uh, we don't get the figures for the Ukrainian losses from the Russians. Um, and there is some confusion I've had in the past as to whether this includes Wagner uh, mercenaries and even LPR uh, and DPR fighters. So th there was a claim the other day that this doesn't include Wagner mercenaries. And if it doesn't, the the the, the similar the person making this claim uh, said there could be another you know thirty thousand to add to that. Uh, so these figures might be considerably higher. Um, or indeed, they could be considerably lower because they are overinflated. So, yeah, there are your caveats. Uh, another 420 troops, so uh, quite a bit of a downtick from the previous week. Five tanks, six APCs, one artillery system. And that's, as I keep saying, that's the main figure as far as I'm concerned. Really, if Ukraine have had a good day if that figure is in double figures for sure. 61 cruise missiles, saturation missile attack yesterday. Uh, there were a bunch of cruise missiles sent over um, and other missiles as well and uh, possibly sort of well actually I'm not aware that any drones were but uh, 14 vehicles and fuel tanks so that's uh, an uptick there and two pieces of special equipment that could be anything so talking about that saturation missile attack yesterday uh, the British intelligence update said previously these drones have so the ways of strikes had largely consisted of air and maritime launch cruise missiles but have almost certainly also included Iranian provided uncrewed aerial vehicles UOVs being launched from Russia's Krasnodar region so that's interesting. So they used to be, so the drones, which was the day before, it appears, and, and I think the day before that as well, uh, w you were previously launched from um, Crimea, and now they're being launched from elsewhere. Uh, why is that? Well, previously, these UOVs have been primarily launched from locations within occupied Crimea. The change of launch site is likely due to Russian concerns about the vulnerability of Crimea. So is it within striking range? Uh, while it is also convenient for resupply from the weapons likely arrival point in Russia at Astrakhan. So Astrakhan is, uh, doo -doo -doo, we have uh, a port there. Even though it looks like it's inland, it is actually uh, a port as far as I understand, as well as being an airport. And um, that is where they're receiving a lot of stuff from Iran, so it's likely that the drones are being launched from there, or, or at least somewhere around here, rather than on Crimea. And that tells you how difficult it is to get stuff over the Kerch Bridge, possibly. Gives you an indication of the feeling about Crimea not as, as, as solid as it, as it was previously. So that is interesting. The other thing to note about these launches is that almost all of them were launched over the Caspian Sea, these cruise missiles from the air, um, and that again tells you something i guess uh it's a it's a lot safer for the russians to do that and uh, any other missiles can fall in the sea if they if they don't work as they should do however there was there was reports yesterday that two fell in this oblast or the um Volg volgograd oblast so around here so two fell in that area and it could have been in transit from the caspian sea region uh Apparently, two anti-ship missiles were sent uh, from Crimea and they were shot down over Odessa. So that's interesting. Why are they using anti-ship missiles? Again, is it because they don't have the stocks of regular cruise missiles that they would like to be using instead? Air defense over Kiev shot down 37 of 40 missiles using the RST, the TRML-4D radar and the Gepard. Uh, so that's really good stats. In total, 60 out of 76 projectiles were shot down, which is just under 80%. Um, and I guess that's pretty good stats. Uh, uh, talking about air defense missile systems, surface-to-air missile systems, Greece could deliver S-300s, which is what Ukraine would like, although it's really about the missiles, um, I would I would argue at the moment, rather than the actual systems. The Greek defense minister, uh, Nikolas uh, Panagiotopoulos 
said that the country is ready to deliver S-300 surface-to-air missile systems from Crete to Ukraine if the US installs a Patriot system in its place, of course. You know, they want to be upgraded. Greece has approximately eight fire units of 32 launchers on the island of Crete, mainly due mainly to deal with a future Turkish threat, which is nowadays, you know, something of a non-issue. Both parties are NATO and won't attack one another. So therefore, Greece are probably feeling they're in a good situation to bargain, getting better equipment, being a bit opportunistic here, so that they can give their older Soviet-era equipment to Ukraine. Um, uh, talking about sort of lack of stocks, this is a, a packing sheet of a Russian 152mm round found in Kherson. Kherson. Round, the round was manufactured in 2022, recently, very recently, this year, for the Azerbaijan Azerbaijan MOD, according to the contract of the um, of this, you know, or of the twenty twenty one. So according to the twenty twenty one contract. So this is interesting that if they are using a manufactured rounds from twenty twenty two that have come from Azerbaijan, what does this say say about the Russian domestic stocks of one fifty two millimeter rounds that they use in their artillery? That is, uh, I think. Uh, a very interesting find there. Anyway, let's get on to the front lines. So as per usual, let's go northeast, where we'll go from Kupiansk down to Svatva to Kremina. Look at this front line. Uh, not a lot has changed, to be perfectly honest. Um, there's repelled attacks. It seems like the um, the Russians are trying to do spoiling counterattacks to hem the rush uh, the ukrainians back uh, so that they can't do their sort of major offensive um at least that's what some some sources are suggesting there's uh a, a, you know the typical things going on haven't heard much around the tavoshanka area up north i'm just going to show you a bit of footage from so orliansky seems to be still under russian control fighting around there um and then as we come further down south it's the old uh, Novoselivska and Kuzumivka. Just some interesting footage out of Novoselivka. We did hear about thermobaric TOS 1A projectiles and uh, bits of equipment being used in the Novoselivska area. Well, here's s some sort of evidence of that. As uh, And this is, you know, when they say the town has been razed to the ground, again, it's looking like this building's completely decimated. And, and as you can see, they're com at, at times just completely taken out. Uh, so they're not, they're not even much of a husk is standing. They're just completely obliterated. Uh, and that's the sort of thing that's going on here. And you can see it's, it's quite flat around here. What it's, and quite easy to take out with artillery and, and thermobaric projectiles. So it's probably not a great place to be doing some fighting, positional fighting, and therefore you can understand why the Ukrainians might have pulled out of there. And then you get sort of footage like this that suggests that it is just, um, yeah, not a, not a great place. The sort of thing that we've seen elsewhere, we've seen in Marin Marienka, we've seen in Solodar, we've seen around Bakhmut in other areas, just... Uh, the ravages of war on these communities, on these settlements, and you know the idea that um, uh, that it's you know war is apocalyptic, isn't it? Uh, so that's Novoselitsk, and and um, there you go. There are lots more footage like that, but the 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 long and short of it is no real changes in the mapping. Um, as we come all the way down south, it's just you know same sort of positional fighting that we hear artillery duels Ploschchanka, repelled attacks repelled attacks around chivona papivka i suppose something to note is that uh, the russians claim to have destroyed uh ukrainian sabotage groups around turney and the, around dobrova and so actually the russian this whole area could be back to being a gray zone again as there are reports of fighting but again it's like towards turney does that mean like outside turning does it mean in the middle here does it mean back towards Kremina? you know but just fighting towards air or uh, and so on and so forth so it just uh, i've actually moved my uh my ukrainian lines a little further back here i just think everything's a bit more of a gray zone again i think the weather uh, has has been playing its part around there um if we look at the institute for the study of war um it talks about 
Ukrainian and Russian forces continue fighting positional battles on the western outskirts of Bilirivka. So just to remind you, Bilirivka is this um, settlement there, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, Russian MOD claimed that forces also destroyed Ukrainian sabotage and reconnaissance groups uh, southwest of Kremlin near Terny, as I said, in Dubrova, um, and likely doing spoiling counterattacks in eastern Kharkiv and western Luhansk Oblast to preempt the Ukrainian forces. So the Russian forces continue to build defensive fortifications along the Svatovo Kremlin line as of December the 16th. The UK Ministry of Defence has reported on um, December the 16th that Russian forces have continued to construct extensive defensive lines along the front line in eastern Ukraine particularly around Svatova. Um, but the UK MOD reported that the Russian defensive lines follow traditional entrenchment methods, which are likely to be vulnerable to modern precision indirect strikes. So that's uh, um, worth sort of noting that it... That, but I've been long saying that these defensive lines aren't going to be perfect, but they are going to to do something of a job of slowing down and and being a thorn in the side of, of a Ukrainian advance. So if you've got defensive lines right the way down here, uh, uh, even if they are vulnerable to some kind of indirect attacks, you've still got to put the effort in to take out those defences and you're still going to waste time clearing them out, uh, so on and so forth. So I think the Russians have probably done a good job in in building those defences, even though they won't be perfect. So around Belarivka as well, it's worth noting that there are some sources saying that Russians have been fighting around uh, Friorivka. And that is, again, talking about these sort of um, incursions behind uh Bilirivka, if you like to the south of Bilirivka, up towards the um Serebianka forest uh around it or towards Serebianka and the and, and the forest up here so that is slightly worrying again there's just not a huge amount of detail coming out at the moment uh and then we come on down to uh Bakhmut and and the, and the front around there Okay, Bakhmut. So we're going to talk a little bit about Yakolivka, uh, Solodar and Bakhmut. Interesting uh, point that it appears that the troops fighting in this uh, eastern suburbs of Bakhmut appear to be um, Russian regular troops and Donetsk militia. Uh, there are claims, you know, that obviously Wang Wagner are the people doing the fighting around Bakhmut, but it might not just be Wagner now. There might be a mix of different troops and the provenance of those troops is somewhat you know not 100 percent sure at the moment but it's interesting that it's not just wagner okay yakolivka the russians have claimed that they've cleared out completely cleared out uh, yakolivka uh, the, the many russian sources are saying that russian mill bloggers uh claiming that russian forces completely cleared yakolivka which will help russian forces to conduct assaults in the direction of solidar geolocated footage posted on december the 16th shows wagner group units operating in central yakolivka supporting this Russian claim. Now, it's it's a little bit unclear. Um, so this is, I think, some, some of the footage of them in the middle of Yakolivka, which looks like it is there. Um, but it doesn't mean they control all of Yakolivka. And there's still some, some sources are, are saying that they don't control the whole of, of Yakolivka, as simple as that. And that is going to be important. I think it will be important for Ukraine to keep a foothold in, in Yakolivka, because as they say, if Yakolivka goes, then that is um, free reign to start attacking Solodar from a different direction. And then, of course, up to uh, Vasily and, and to help flank Bilirivka. So it becomes a very important uh, air point for the north of Bakhmut in the same way we talk I've talked about Opitnia and Klyshchivka being incredibly important to the south uh, Yakolivka is is potentially the key to Solidar so it's really important that the Ukrainians do keep a foothold there but it is somewhat was somewhat unsure as to exactly where the Ukrainians are there um as Defmon has said uh Last night, Russian telegrams claimed to have fully captured Yakolivka based on evidence today. I think it's likely they have captured most or all of it. So Defmon is conceding that himself, uh, whilst also producing a map that, that so shows, well, for sure they have this much. They might have it all. Um, so there you go. Heavy fighting solo continues. More footage of, you know, the absolute destruction that's taking place in, in some of these places. Uh, you know, the smoking wrecks of buildings. Um, so that's Solidar. Uh, we've seen, you know, footage of, of stuff happening in Solidar. But again, exactly where the lines are in Solidar 
it's, it's a bit of a guess. It's just, it, you know, those lines could be back here. They could be all over the shop. Um, There's just a lot of fighting going on in, in Solidar and, of course, back in Mutska as well. Uh, there is um, claim that will not claim that, evidence that you, Russians are using pretty widespread incendiary munitions. Um, and these are obviously covering quite a large area. If you look at how much is being sent into the air and all of that coming down that will that will cover a huge area each one of those little glints is enough to you know set you on fire and kill you uh, so that's pretty devastating uh, use of that kind of munition not not illegal at least they've not signed up to that being illegal uh, so as far as the russians are concerned and in fact the ukrainians i think the ukrainians are using these as well um it, it is part of the course of war um, but they are nasty, um, nasty munitions, really. Uh, Got to be pretty scary to see them, them raining down on you. Okay, as we go to uh, Bakhmut itself, um, not a great amount of information has come out again. Uh, War Mapper's map of uh, the town, is, which is a lovely looking map, I, I love this map, but it says that there have been no confirmed changes of control since the last update, so 24 hours, no change. Um, War map has the waste disposable uh, plant in the in the hands of the Ukrainians. There's a large sort of grey area, grey zone, um, and in fact doesn't really have any of the eastern suburbs in Russian hands. So that's interesting. I mean, I would contest that. I think there certainly is. This is what no report says that actually it's pretty much all a grey area there. But only a, only a couple of blocks seem to be fully in Russian hands. Um, my map, I'm going along with some other mappers saying that you know they could got, have gone as far as it. But again, you know, you could have Russians controlling a, a set of buildings, and then two hours later they've been pushed out there, and then you know the next day they're pushing back in. So these things are really dynamic. Um, I've adapted the 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 Ukrainian lines to fit in with no reports there to show that that this is the definite line of Ukrainian uh, control. There could be a little argument over there, and it could be that the Russians only really properly control a couple of blocks there, and the rest is just grey zone. Um, so, yeah, again, it's the fog of war. Not quite sure exactly what's going on there. Um, now, I'm just going to take you back to the Institute for the Study of War. It's an interesting claim here. Russian milk blogger claimed that Ukrainian forces consider holding Bakhmut a, a priority task over fears that losing the settlement would damage the current image of Ukrainian forces. I'd agree. I think for both forces, that's the case. So if, if Russia don't take it, then it shows how impotent their, their army is, even with the Wagner, how long this has taken. They really, really need this uh, for, a, uh, for PR reasons, but also... For actually for tactical and strategic reasons as well. Um, but the, the Ukrainians likewise can't let it go because that will be a huge uh, PR loss for them as well. And they are appealing to other countries to help them. Uh, and they need to show some kind of success to justify uh, the West and NATO giving them these uh, weapons and equipment. Geolocated footage posted on December 16th shows that Russian forces have made marginal advances west of, of Ozoranivka. Now, uh, this is worth sort of dwelling on a little bit. So you got fighting in Opitny. It's difficult to know exactly where the fighting is. There's some people have actually Russians only really only in, in this area around here. Um, I'm just keeping my map lines as that. It seems to go back and forth to some degree. Klitschivka fighting around there, repelled attacks around Klitschivka. But Ozan, uh, Ozarianivka here. Um, so you have Bilahora where there's some recruitment, rec uh, uh, reinforced Ukrainian troops around there, about 60 mobilized troops. Interestingly, they are mobilized rather than regular troops. Um, not sure how accurate that is. That was from uh, Rybar who said that. Uh, Cody Mivka fighting around here, but it's this Oz Ozarian Ozarianivka here. And indeed, I showed you yesterday uh, some footage. In fact, here is the footage of a uh, of a trench system being hit with airburst shells. So, these are, so that's a regular shell, and then you have other shells that explode above and then spread the area with um, with kind of tungsten balls or, or 
shrapnel or whatever. Anyway, you can see that there's a rectangular uh, system here with some kind of buildings or what's left of buildings in the middle. Um, and I've, I have geolocated this. Uh, you've got uh, a canal in the background curving round and uh, you've got some sort of road and or trench systems curling around like that over one side of it. Okay, so anyway, that system, that apparently that was where 35 to 40 Russian soldiers were positioned and uh, half of them were killed uh, and unknown amount of injured, but, you know, they, they were basically taken out of their um, pretty, pretty hardcore uh, footage. Now, this is almost 100% certainly this entrenchment here, this system here. So you've got Ozarina Nivka there. Uh, Kurdi and Mivka over there, and you've got this trench system here, which has been there. This is obviously 2019 uh, uh, footage from Google Images. This is the rectangle. You have the canal curving around in the background, and you have that curling exactly in that pattern, that curling bit of uh, trench that comes out there and goes down, down there. Now, this system was taken out. So this is definitely in Russian hands. Um, but it, it was uh, absolutely, you know, blasted by Ukrainian artillery and mortar fire. So that's just an interesting uh, geolocated point to to somewhere around here. Uh, arguably, they're pushing on towards this area, but that would suggest they're being hemmed in by artillery and mortar fire right there. This is exactly what Defmona says. The Russians have crossed the canal west of Ozurinivka and established positions in the previous UA trenches. Um, absolutely, I'll just say that that is exactly where the, the trenches that they have uh, taken are, uh, rather than sort of back over here. So um, uh, the other thing to note around Bakhmut, and some pro-Ukrainian sources were sort of saying, yay, uh, they are there as in HIMARS or G GLMRS, are working in and around back is the claim. And they're sending up these HIMARS rockets potentially onto the front line in the Bakhmut area. And I've heard other people call for this as well. And I'm not sure that this is, well, it's not what HIMARS are designed for. They're designed for doing long range attacks on high, high value targets rather than trying to take out positions and front lines and and i'm not really sure that a that, that that's what that footage shows that they are doing that and b that that would be the best use of of that kind of munition which would be you know wasted when it could be taking out groups of you know huge numbers of troops or ammunition depots or supply depots rather than a group of five or six troops sitting around in trenches here or taking out certain i mean you could argue that if they could geolocate uh, artillery systems around here, then that would be a good use of that. Because my opinion is that these artillery systems sitting around Bakhmut is what are, are really hammering the, the Ukrainians. But of course, those systems, once they shoot a couple of rounds, then they're moved. And it is very difficult to to locate them being in place at any one time. Um, so there you go. Anyway, that's Bakhmut. Still heavy fighting going on there. As we come down south from Bakhmut, we come to Avdivka, uh, past Shumi, uh, New York, Druzhba. I think that's pushing towards Druzhba, but uh, not much else around here. There is fighting pushing towards Alexandropil and uh, from uh, in around Novobakhmutivka, uh, which is north of Avdivka. Uh, Avdivka, sorry, and can represent this attempt to encircle it from the north, but it doesn't seem to be going too far. The same with the south, although there are claims that the Russians were pushing, attacking towards a repelled attack towards Nitalove and Kalivka, which is quite some way out. There's attacks towards Sijuene as well from the day before. So it's interesting. There are movements around here. Uh, of course, you've got Vodyany, Povomysky, Pisky, and Opidny as well, um, repelled attacks there. Uh, I think the Ukrainians pushed back a little bit around Krasnoharivka, which is further down south. Uh, there seems that Marienka is the major consideration now that the, the Russian, I know it's been going on for a hell of a long time, but it seems that there is this renewed uh, desire and attempts for Russia to take control of Marienka. So there's sort of fierce fighting around there, around Pobjeda, just to the south 
uh, west of there. And then Nova Mokhalivka, uh, there is fighting, the Russians are pushing around there. So I'm actually going to sort of draw that back to here. This seems to be where the Russians are pushing. And on the other hand, the Ukrainians appear to be uh, pushing back further down south here. So the, the, the Ukrainians are pushing down Vukhodar, Mikilska, uh, Mikilska, yep, yeah, uh, and Volodymykurivka, whereas the Russians are pushing in Novomikhailivka. But not really an awful lot of news other than repelled attacks, repelled attacks, that kind of stuff. Uh, Ukrainians attacking as well towards uh, Solodka, actually, as well. Uh, and apparently around Novomayorsky and I think uh, somewhere else as well, uh, uh, yeah, Shevchenko here, Ukrainian recon groups were apparently, you know, destroyed or attacked or repelled by the Russians, uh, depending on how you interpret their claims there. So it looks like the Ukrainians are pushing down here, the Russians are pushing sort of up here, and, well, pretty much all the way up this uh, Donetsk front um, from north to south there up to Bakhmut. As far as the, the rest of the Zaporizhia Oblast and Kherson Oblast are concerned, not a lot of news really other than the usual shelling. So the usual artillery duels along here. Zaporizhia took 21 S-300 missiles, I think, yesterday uh, or in recent days. And, there's, you know, it gets uh, an absolute battering from uh, S-300s as well as Mayonets and Nikopol. Uh, apparently the uh, DNR, I think, are dug in around here. Um, and that there, there are troop accumulations. In fact, let's read you what the ISW has to say. Um, Russian forces continue to undertake defensive measures on the left or the east bank of the Dnipro River. The Ukrainian general staff reported that Russian forces deployed personnel from Krasnodar Krai to strengthen defensive lines and security for water supply facilities in Kherson Oblast and Crimea such as the North Crimean Canal. Sentinel-1 imagery, so satellite imagery, also showed that Russian forces have accumulated a large amount of military equipment in Medvedivka in northeastern Crimea. The Donetsk People's Republic militia claimed to hold defensive positions in the area along the Kokovka Reservoir in Zaporizhia Oblast. So, you know, there is a lot of defensive posturing going on there and some accumulations in, in the northeast of Crimea. Um, so that you know it shows you that that what their long term intentions are for uh, the Russians. Um, I can't get rid of that for some reason, but uh, that's around here, Medvedivka. Um, yeah, it's not going. Uh, so there you go. That's the frontline update. Hopefully that was of some uh, interest uh, and was in. Formational, but there's not a great amount of news coming out. There's a lot of positional fighting. Uh, again, it's all really about Bakhmut. Everywhere else, there's a bit of a stasis. Uh, you could say that Marinka as well. But um, yeah, there you go. Uh, please like, subscribe, share. Check out my uh, extra videos that are produced after these videos to give you some extra information about the the war and other geopolitical sort of considerations. Um, but if you want to support the channel, there are all the ways you can do it down below. Thank you so much to my members who are legends. I'm going to leave you with uh, just a, a couple of seconds of who they are. Thanks to all members, Sabra Bursavis, Tinji Timbalu, Ricky Johnson, Vagley Agnostic, Mitch Mazarol, uh, Craig McLemore, John Nairik, Jan Nanis, uh, Kilioris, Bo Janssen, RNH Endersby, Holly Irving, Andres Erdovics, Prey Chong, Lee Dixon, and Cynthia Cheno. Really appreciate that. Thanks for all your continued support. Toodle Pip, see you later.